welcome to our live stream overtime session. Uh, we don't do this every Tuesday. Some Tuesdays after our uh, weekly live stream, we uh, come here to a virtual classroom on Zoom and go over some uh, questions in what we call the overtime session. And so uh, it's first come, first serve in the chat. And we have uh, uh, Amato first in the chat. I'm one of my favorite people, and I always say, why is Amato one of my favorite people? And uh, I like him because he doesn't have ghost questions. You know, ghost questions where somebody says, Dean, there's somewhere in the Kaplan materials or Path Perfect, there's a question about ghost something like. And those questions are kind of hard to kill, right? If we have a QID, we can bring it up. We can see what it's about. We can talk about it and kill it. And that way it, it, it dies rather than, you know, keeps showing up. So efficient market hypothesis. So the weak forms, it will knock out Amato's 66 questions here first. And then we will, uh, again, uh, Isaac, go over that QID. I'm assuming, I think it's series six, right? So it's a Kaplan. It's only Kaplan I can bring up backstage. If it's not a Kaplan question, then, then you know, you have to screenshot it or tell me what it is. Uh, so let's just talk about efficient market uh, hypothesis. Um, it, hypothesis isn't true. It's a way of explaining things. And you are on 65, 66, going to get one, maybe even two questions on the efficient market hypothesis. Uh, I think the way I like to uh, work it is go from strong and weak. So strong is nothing works. Weak is that, yeah, something could uh, could work, but it's certainly not going to be technical analysis. And by definition of this question, and this is spot on, Amato, in terms of what you're going to see as a potential test question about the efficient market hypothesis. So the reason that doesn't work is because everybody has that information and it's historical. According to the theory, by the way, I got to stress that. Hypothesis and truth. You know, my brother and I get into it all the time. I go, Chris, you have a hypothesis. I have a hypothesis. We both might be wrong for all we know. You know, I like my hypothesis better because, it, you know, it doesn't take as many complexities to make it work. You know, but, you know, yours, you know, uh, it takes a lot. So it's not truth. Uh, is there something you like better than this? Uh, weak form would be that fundamentalists are, uh, the way they test this on uh, semi-strong would mean material non-public information would work. That would be semi-strong. And as I mentioned, strong would be nothing works. Nothing works. Okay, so let's see. Your next one is, I like that. That's pretty spot on. Uh, your next yeah, one, you. 1519. Four nine six. And I'm just gonna make that a little bigger so people can see it. Uh, the Uniform Securities Act requires client consent for the assignment of investment advisory contract. Again, very testable. You should definitely know that. Here they gave it to you. So, you, oh, thank you very much. Yeah, I already knew that, but yeah. it would, can be considered that contracts were signed in all the following situations except. So the reason A is the right answer is a minority interest isn't a change in control. If you own 20% a model and you die, you hasn't changed the control nature of the firm. I mean, we're sad you're not with us anymore, but you know, uh, by the way, it doesn't matter the guy's dead. This could be a minority sh uh, share partner who, you know, retires. You know, we don't have to kill him. I don't know why on the test people like, they like dead people. We're always killing people, you know, but uh, the key point is minority interest. If he was a majority interest, then that would uh, definitely trigger the consent. Let's look at our next one. The sole stockholder, so he owns 100% of the stock, pledges all the stock in the firm, his club or bank loan, that could be changing the control because if he doesn't pay, the bank's going to foreclose and they're going to be running the place. So that's a potential change in control. Uh, the sole provider of an investment advisory sells the firm. Yeah, if I'm sole provider and I sell it to someone else, that means somebody new is in charge. And you said, well, I hired Dean. I didn't hire you. You have the ability to consent to that. Two investment advisory firms intend to merge, causing a change in the majority interest indeed. 
Uh, the other one on that one, by the way, is does the surviving entity, the new firm, have to pay any additional fees? No, not till December 31st, right? And then they uh, they do have to uh, update their form ADV promptly. All right, let's see what your next one is. 152-1270. Uh, by the way, I should give the Kaplan commercial. Uh, with my 15% discount code at checkout, you can get a QBank for 15% less. I'm not sure what the 66 is. And for that commercial, Kaplan allows me to give people free look at Kaplan content. So, you know, in case there's any copyright people out there, uh, I am legally authorized to be using Kaplan content. Um, anyways, uh, Kaplan asset pricing model, oh my God, is used by many to assess uh, the expected return of a security. So the first thing I like to do, you know, the math, there's a lot of ways to go. Uh, I immediately a model like to say, okay, well, of the 10% market return, I could have got 3% without risking my cap. So that's where I like to start out, just get that there and say, okay, so, you know, boom, I just like to net that right out of there. And that kind of makes sense, right? I mean, what makes sense here is that you know, 3% they're telling us is what we get for not hazarding or risking our capital. A stock has a beta of 1.4. So that means the stock is 1.4 more volatile uh, than the market. Uh, standard deviation has nothing to do with answering this question. So what they try and do, I call this the Jedi mind trick, where they try and cloud your mind with things that have nothing to do with answering the question. So uh, the computation is as follows. So we take the 10%, uh, the return on the market is a beta one minus the risk-free. I did that right off the bat. So I told you, I just, the minute I get one of these questions, I just net the risk-free from the market return. And then we multiply that by 1.4 and that gives us 9.8. That is the stock should re uh, return 9.8 above risk-free or 12.8, what that means is uh, above the risk-free rate of return. And as we said, the standard deviation is not re relevant. So we multiply uh, that by the beta 1.4 to arrive at 9.8. Now, why is 9.8 not the answer? Because it says uh, the expected return, right? So now we're gonna add back in the risk-free rate of return because we're gonna get the 3%. And so we take Take it out. It's kind of confusing, but we take it out and then we add it back in, right? So now I say, okay, so I'm expecting 9.8, but, you know, 3% of that, I'm going to be able to get from the risk-free rate of return. And remember, so I got to say, okay, well, I could get that without risking my capital. So I'm not going to risk my capital unless I expect to get 12.8%. So I think that's where most people mess this up. I don't think, that, again... This is a high risk and will cause you to, uh, you know, miss your exam. But I think this is where most people, uh, we take it out and then we throw it back, right? Uh, I think you'd be fine, by the way, to just, in most situations, another one that comes up in the Kaplan is where we don't tell you the uh, risk-free rate or risk-free rate of return. And then you just simply take the 1.4 times, you know, whatever the return is. So, you know, sometimes it's even simpler than that. Okay, so that was Amato's first three questions. It looks like Isaac is next in the queue. So let me get out of this thing here. Hey, Dean. Hey, what's up, Isaac? Let's <laughs> see if I can back out of the yeah, Kaplan Q Bank. There we go. You're Series well, 6, right? Yeah, a lot, of, a lot of alpha and beta. Every, every Yeah, 6. I got to tell you, 6. I'd be surprised you get a lot of that on the test. Every time I get that on my practice exams, that's one time I consistently. Uh, this is the new look, cannot, by the way. Uh, cannot you, make the old sense look of or the old new look? This I'm is in the, the new, new look. look of the Kaplan uh, learning management system, they call it. So 139, uh, 3120. I mean, it is like other one-offs, but alpha and beta is like consistent. So, you know, again, let's just to briefly talk about this. Uh, beta is a measurement of volatility uh, as compared to the market as a whole, the S&P 500. You know, and again, you know, the, this is the baggage that Dean brings into this. There is no airline stock that is going to be less volatile than the market. 
they're saying this is 80% as volatile as the market. So we think if the market goes up 10, this should go up eight. It's gonna underperform in a rising market and it's going to outperform in a down market because it's gonna go down 80%, not 100% of the market decline. So the stock declined two, while the market declined five, alpha is the return over beta. I think this is outrageous. I don't think you're gonna actually have to do this on the actual real series seven. In fact, this is more likely to be on 65, 66. But we take the market return of five, we times it by the 8%, 8 0.08, 80%, and we would have expected this to go down 4%. And it only went down two. So that other 2% is alpha, the excess return over beta. Beta would have been negative four. It only did negative two. And so the 2% is the excess over beta. Beta says should have been negative four. And it was only negative two. The difference, by the way, it's an absolute value. Uh, you know, if we go from negative four degrees outside Isaac in Minnesota to negative two degrees in Minnesota, we are at positive two degrees, right? Yes. So that's why it's not negative. Did you answer the negative two? Did you get close to it or not? Um, when I did it, I, I did positive. No, I did negative two. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, you would have taken the, it's a, you know, it's gotta be the, the negative, the move is negative. So, you know, we would expect it to go down 80% of the negative five and that's negative four, right? That's how we got to negative that four. Okay. All right. Let's see what our next one is. Our next one. It's in the same realm. <laughs> Well, you know, that's good if it's the same realm because that means if we fix it, then maybe, you know, we don't have to, you know, fix it again, right? I, I worry I mean, more a... about people, Isaac, who are all over the place than I worry about people who are consistently, you know, missing questions. Uh, which of the following explains that including non-correlated assets in a portfolio uh, can return, return uh, reduce certain risks? So under modern portfolio theory, theory isn't truth. It's just a way of explaining something. And so if I have Exxon in your portfolio, Isaac, and I put Chevron in there, I haven't really accomplished anything under modern portfolio theory because the correlation between Exxon and Chevron is almost one. They're in the same businesses. So if I'm a practitioner under modern portfolio theory, uh, I wouldn't want to have something in your portfolio that does the same thing, right? I mean, if I put, uh, for example, Lowe's and Home Depot, those are basically the same stocks. So maybe I say, you know what I'm going to do, Isaac? I'm going to put, instead of Chevron, now maybe I put Delta into your portfolio, the airline company, because they have negative correlation. When oil prices go up, Exxon goes up. And Delta goes down because of the cost of jet fuel. And when oil goes down, Exxon goes down. But Delta goes up because of the cheap uh, fuel. So here is what I want to do in your portfolio is I want to put something in your portfolio that has negative correlation, right? And that is a concept under modern portfolio theory. Under modern portfolio theory. All right. So it looks like uh, Isaac has one more here. So that's modern portfolio theory. Not true. It's just a way of explaining things. Um, boy, you it looks like you're getting a six draw from Oh, you know, Isaac, these are uh, more, I think, uh, you know, 66, 65 questions and six questions, but oh my God. All right, let's well, see. Our I... next one is 1392591. 91. Uh, the XY. Okay. All right. Woohoo. Finally, we got something that is on the broad avenues and highways of the series 66. Uh, by Six. the way, I would be prepared to do this on the SIE. I would be prepared to do this on the 7. I would be prepared to do this on 65, 66. So when given the NAV and the sales charge, calculate the public offering price. And that's the scenario. We had that scenario shows up on the test. The other scenario that shows up on the test is when given the NAV and the public offering price, uh, calculate the percentage sales charge. So the way we're going to do this is we're going to take 19 
and we're going to divide by 100% minus the sales charge. And so that's called the complement. So the way I think of it is, of every dollar you invest in this fund, uh, five cents is not going into the fund. Five cents, 5% 5 is the load. And so when I do that, I get 95% or 0.95. And then we do the math and we hope we come up with one of the answers, 19 divided by 0.95. And I come up with 20. That is very much something you should do. That is actually more likely than the other ones, Isaac, that we do, we're working on. All right. So the way you do it is you take the NAV and you divide by 100% minus the sales charge. Okay. Very much a test question. Okay. How did I get the 9.8? The 9.8, Danny, uh, I got by taking the Market return of 10% minus the risk-free rate of return, 3%, that's 7%. And then I times the 7% by the beta of 1.4. So that's how I did that. Okay, well, let's see. We got anything else? Oh, that's great because I've had a long-ass day. Man, I taught the Series 7 all day long. Did the live stream this evening, doing the overtime session. And Isaac, uh, let's uh, plan on trying to get something on. When's your test date? Uh, the 20... 26. What is that? Next Saturday? That's or next Saturday? Friday. So not a next week, Friday. Uh, a week okay, so from gonna, this Friday. I'm going to send you an email uh, and I'm going to see if we can uh, get something on the sky. I want to do it. I'm just trying to find the time. Okay. Because it yeah. comes in late. Uh, comes in late with a... Oh. Sorry. All right, let's see if we can back up. This last one, last one. That's all right. Yeah, that's what we're here for. Uh, let's see. Yeah, let's find the chat. Uh, your Series 7. Uh, boom. 66. Oh, 66. So we got a... Those ones that you had for your 6, Isaac's questions about it were... Uh, I thought more 66-like than uh, 7. Very Did I get helpful. the right QBank? Let's see if I got the right QBank. Happy to help my 66 test taker. <laughs> Yeah, I have my exam on Thursday, so I am uh, a little crazy here. Okay, so there's R66. You don't have the pretty view version yet of the new Kaplan learning mm -hmm. management system. Uh, 157 0806. 157 Is it part of the midterm or something? It's not coming up. Yeah, it was a part of a checkpoint. Uh, do you want to you want to put it on your screen? You're welcome to share your screen. It's not coming up for me backstage. Yeah, definitely. Let me... I just I, you just hit the there's a green button that says share screen. If anybody's watching the NBA games, don't tell me because I've got them queue up. I don't want to know what's going on. All right, so let's see here. Although many advisors to private funds are exempt from registration, larger ones generally register with the SEC. That's true. I think of like, like Blackstone, uh, Carlisle, um, TPG. KKR. Uh, KKR. There you go, Danny. Uh, the, the originals, Danny, the originals. Uh, let's see if I can still remember. Jerome, Kohlberg, Kravis, and Roberts. That was the original partners. Are any of them still around? They might be just, you know, clipping. It's Scott Nutell and Joseph Bai that's running um, KKR. Uh, Schwab just uh, wrote his memoirs called Invested, and he has different vignettes. And uh, I think it was pretty cool because uh, he was struggling to raise money to buy back Schwab from uh, from Bank of America. And uh, I guess he plays golf in the Cypress Garden Club with, uh, you know, one of those guys. And he said, ah, no problem. We can take care of this. <laughs> that's pretty cool. You know, so, yeah, a billion, not a problem. You know, we got it. All right, so SEC registered advisors with at least 150 million in private fund assets under management use which form to report the information about private funds they manage? Uh, yeah, this is not a bad miss, but it's going to be uh, the PF form PF for private funds. I think the more likely test question is found in the rationale here, uh, which is that we have to form file form 13F, and that's filed quarterly. That is definitely testable. And that makes for good reading, right? To see what uh, Berkshire Hathaway is doing or, you know, what these uh, people are doing with the money, right? 
So I actually think the rationale where it says form 13F, I think is what you need to know and that's filed quarterly. Uh, so uh, now you know, that's one of those recognition ones. Anything else? Let's check out chat. Do we got anything else uh, in that? Let me stop sharing. Uh, Taj, okay, so we got Taj uh, come to the mar uh, thing here. Uh, Taj, uh, what exam is that for? This is series 65. 65, okay. Let me go get the Kaplan Q Bank again. It's back out of this one. 65, boom. Okay, let's see now. Let's go get our Q Bank. Oh, you got the pretty version. You got the pretty version of the, the thing now. Let me go back and get your QID. Uh, 1522340. Oh, I like this. This is very much a test question. So, Taj, regardless of the business cycle, you need to eat. Can you delay purchasing a new airplane? You know, Taj might, might get a couple more flights out of my old G5. Absolutely. Aerospace stocks are cyclical. Uh, stock selling at a high PE. No, high PE would be a growth stock. Uh, stock with strong cash and little debt uh, gives me a margin of safety in buying that stock, but we don't know from that whether it's defensive. So food companies are defensive because you got to eat. The one they like on the test, Taj, is utilities, right? Nobody wants to go back to the Stone Age. So defensive stocks are in industries that are resilient to the business cycle. Utilities are resilient to the business cycle. I might cut back on usage, but not entirely, you know, on my, you know, my air or my heat or whatever the case may be. Uh, pharmaceuticals are defensive. If you're sick and I'm a doctor and I tell you you need a particular drug, I say, listen, I got a cheap one. It kind of works. I got an expensive one. It's patented, but it works. If it doesn't work, you're going to die. What do you want? I was teaching one time, Dodge, and I brought up pharmaceuticals. And the guy goes, yeah, Dean, I know when times are tough, I need my weed. His name was Steve. I go, Steve, we are not talking about recreational drugs. We are talking about pharmaceuticals. So pharmaceuticals, food companies, utilities. Uh, some people think tobacco and liquor are kind of defensive because or if you're not even defensive, counter-cyclical, because people drink and smoke more. Uh, Taj, do you remember which one you like? Did you like one better than food? What was giving you troubles on this one? Um, I don't think um, I had it at all. Should I think defensive? When I think of defensive, do I think of non-cyclical? Yeah, yeah. You, what you think okay. of it, when you're when you're thinking defensive stocks, you're thinking of stocks that deliver products and services resilient to the business cycle, products and services that people got to get no matter what their economic situation is, right? So people are pissed right now because of inflation, because when they go to the grocery store, they can recognize it, right? Because every time I buy a carton of eggs, I go, I was just here last week. You know, what's up going on, right? Now, I might substitute things, but I still got to go grocery shopping, right? I got to, you know, I got to buy groceries. Well, uh, by the way, I might not eat out as much, but you know, you know, that's defensive wouldn't be like a high end restaurant. Cause you know, I might do, you know, let's say, you know what, I think I'll cook at home. You know? So, so yeah, you should be thinking products and services that consumers must have regardless of the economy, right? They got to eat, they got to have power, uh, you know, uh, you know, cyclical, the other one would be the opposite it would be cyclical. Aerospace is cyclical. Those are products and services consumers can delay purchasing. You know, for example, the CEO of Caterpillar recently, Taj, said we're having difficulties because people are delaying purchasing new Caterpillar D8s and excavators and, you know, a Caterpillar bulldozers, you know, millions of dollars. If I'm a contractor, I say, eh, you know, maybe I'll get a couple more jobs on my old one. Autos are cyclical, right? Can you delay purchasing a new car? You certainly can. Right. And those businesses, when things are good, they're really, really good. Yeah. Tesla's suffering right now, Danny, aren't they? I, the way I understand it, that they might, oh, this is scary, Danny. They might just be a car company. Ooh. And if that's all they are is a car company, 
uh oh then that stock has a long way to come down right so i think they said they're laying off what 10 percent of their employees today and Ten thousand employees yeah I saw yesterday. oh my goodness and the I hear cyber that the, truck is delayed I yeah mean, that, they're going I into robo taxis i didn't really care for that cyber truck i thought it was kind of ugly but what do i know you know and i hear the chinese what is it byd there's a chinese uh, electrical vehicle company that will sell me a uh, an electrical car that's uh, you know a lot cheaper than Tesla. So I think it's build your dream, like, build your dream. What's that? It's build your dream. Oh, is that what that's saying? That's right. I, that. I like two, that. In two thousand eight, go online and order like the car I want or something. Is that why it's called build your dream? Or do I get the car and then go build my dream? I'm not sure <laughs> if the United States lets it sell here. Well, no, I think the tariff. I don't think they don't let them sell, and I think it's a even the ones that are sold have a twenty five percent tariff. I think. And uh, and Elon claims to be a free market guy, but he certainly is in favor of uh, keeping a tariff and not letting them into the U.S. market, right? Because that would really greater in Tesla's thing. I, Danny, am a traditional guy. I like to go to a gas station. Uh, I All the people I know with electrical cars, when it gets cold, like in my cabin in northern Arizona, the batteries don't you know work as well as they should. I would say, though, Danny, in my cabin, and I built it in Arizona, I have the best solar system money can buy. And I feel good because there's a lot of preppers out there and, you know, people like that. And I was the first guy in the neighborhood who used lithium ion batteries. And I got a lithium ion battery that would fly the Millennium Falcon. I never have any power troubles. I could run that place for a week. You know? <laughs> so. Oh, speaking of proxy fights, did you hear about Nelson Paltz and Bob Iger, that thing? Yeah, yeah, that was a serious one. Uh, apparently he lost everything, right? I don't think I... Any of his candidates for the board uh, won. Uh, yeah. yeah, Bob Iger, he rallied the troops, right? He rallied George Lucas. He yeah, plays the was. Disney family. I think, Danny, I think the only guy he saw that Pell Scott was the guy from Mar Mar Marvel, which is a homie. Isaac Perlmutter. Yeah, and then the other one he got was Elon. And Elon doesn't have any, any uh, skin in the game except he hates Iger, right? So Amato's question. Uh, have you heard of many recent draws of the 66 where the 70 rule of 72 is heavily tested? The answer motto is no. In fact, almost never do you get tested on 72. A motto 72, though, is something that can help us if we think we're being asked to do something we're not, right? So for example, this is my favorite version of this. Let me put this up here. Let me get it just a regular whiteboard. Oh, this is fun. Maybe we should just do this and Shoot the shit, uh, Danny, right? Just talk about real world shit instead of uh, the fantasy land that is the test taking world. I joke, <laughs> you guys get to leave the fantasy land once you pass your tests. I'm stuck here permanently. No wonder I'm demented. So, After I pass my test, Dean, like, I'm uh, like, let's, we need, we should just like talk casual. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So here, let I'm me give you a for a motto in Isaac. Yeah. Uh, here's, here's a customer who's 50 years old. And let's just make that bigger here. 50 years old. I'm going to make that big. Boom. And uh, let's say that this uh, customer has uh, $100,000 to invest. And, uh, you know, that's the present value. And he tells me that when he's 70 years old, uh, that he wants to have $400,000. And that's called the future value. And so, you know, you say, Dan, that Dean guy told me that to do these calculations, I would have to know inputs and outputs. I wouldn't have to actually do this. And the question is, uh, what is the rate of return, the internal rate of return that will take 100,000 to 400,000 over 20 years? The internal rate of return. Now, you first, if you look at this, you say, well, gee, I have no clue how I'm going to do this. But if you keep in mind the rule of 72 and you say, okay, well, this question kind of looks symmetrical to me. It kind of looks symmetrical that I'm going on a 20-year journey. That's my time horizon. The time horizon is 20 years. And it looks like if I could get halfway through the journey, halfway through this financial journey, would be 10 years out. Right? That would be 10 years out. 
And I say, okay, well, if I could uh, double this money to $200,000 in 10 years and then double it again, uh, I would be at 400000 So your point, is this a question about the rule of 72? It is not. But can we use the rule of 72 to come up with this answer? <clears throat> we certainly can. Because 72 tells us uh, how long it takes to double money or what rate of return we uh, need. So you have to recognize that you can use the rule of 72 here. And you say, okay, so I'm going to take 72. I'm going to divide by 10 years. And I find out that I need 7.2% to double that money. So if I can double the money, by the way, that's going to be the answer to the question, right? Because if I get 7.2, that will turn the 100,000 to 200,000, right? And then I just have to double it again. And again, it will double on 7.2. So the answer to this question is the internal rate of return necessary is 7.2. You know, that's what takes the present value to the future value. Now, let's just talk about, uh, again, some test language here. You know, as I told you, mainly what we got to recognize is input. So maybe I want you to go from future value to present value. So now the question is, uh, what uh, what amount of money do we need today uh, to uh, get $400,000 20 years from today? So please note it's, it's mainly inputs. To get present value, I need the future value, 400000 I need the number of compounding periods, in this case, 20 years, and I need the 7.2%. If I uh, put that into a calculator and did the math, you don't have to do the math, <laughs> we'd find out that's a hundred grand, or I might ask you uh, a future value question. You know, a customer has a hundred thousand dollars today and wants $400,000 20 years from today. It's mainly the input, right? What do we need to solve this? We need present value, the number of compounding periods, 20 years in this case, and we need the rate of return, right? Uh, this question was asking us, what is the rate of return we need? Right. So, you know, Danny, uh, when I was involved in private equity funds, right, we would say, listen, we're targeting internal rates of return of 20, 25 percent. And there's no no guarantee, Danny, we're going to get that. But in this fund, if we can get an internal rate of return of 20 percent and you're giving me 10 million dollars uh, to invest in this fund, this is what this would look like, you know, in X number of years. Uh, P.S. Danny, I got in trouble with FINRA. You know, FINRA saw uh, an email that I said just what I said to you, Danny. And I said, it sounds like you're guaranteeing a return. <clears throat> I didn't guarantee a return. I said, if we get 20%, this is what that looks like. I didn't say you're going to get 20%. There's right, so many I rules. think that's one of my favorite versions of that. A anything else? So that's the rule of 72. So motto, again, it's not so much you're going to get the rule of 72 as a, you know, aim and shoot point and click question. It's do you recognize how you might use it in a question like that? Right, that question wasn't about the rule of 72, even though it was, right? Because if you didn't recognize the rule of 72, you're going to say, fuck, I don't know, I'm going to beat, <laughs> you know, so. so. Very helpful. Thank you, okay. Dean. I appreciate yeah, it. All right, you're welcome. Anything else before we go on tonight? That's been kind of fun. Anything well, else? I just Going have once? one quick check-in question with like, uh, may, may you please explain the difference between like a short put and like a short call, like just real quickly yeah so remember short you should always think danny potential victim okay short, i know you mentioned don't be a dumb bear that's right well short call is, is a dumb bear for sure short put maybe not because that's a bullish position so okay. let's just review so in a short call i'm obligated to sell the stock in a short put i'm obligated to buy the stock so when we think short, we think potential victim. You know, I got some kind of an obligation to do something. And so in a short call, I'm obligated to sell the stock. And either I have the stock. Or you no borrow problem. from a broker. Well, if I don't, then it's a naked call. So we have two versions of a short call. We have a short call in which I do not own the stock. That's called a naked, uncovered call. And that's going to expose me to unlimited risk, your point. That is a dumb, bearish position. Because you're collecting, it's like picking up nickels in front of bulldozers. We'll use Apple. Apple's at 170 today. 
And so it dropped. Should, I think it's one sixty something. Oh, is it what? Well, then yeah, it dropped. There you go. Its earnings are next week too. Well, there you go. So let's say I uh, I short the call on Apple. I shall short the one seventy calls. I don't think anybody's going to make me deliver the stock at one seventy because you just told me it's one sixty something. And so if I'm right and Apple's one seventy or lower, the calls expire worthless. I go neener neener neener. Now if I'm wrong, the stock goes above seventy. And if I don't have the stock, that means I'm going to have to go into the open market. I'm going to have to buy the stock and deliver the strike price. I used to make every one of my customers who sold a call, covered or not, sign a big boy or a big girl letter saying, you understand that if you're short a call and you get exercised, you're selling the stock at less than the current market price. If I get exercised on an Apple 170 call, Apple is somewhere north of 170. That exposes me to unlimited risk. Yes. That is much stupider than a short put. Let's do the short put. Apple's at 170. Or excuse me, Apple, what's the price? 168, let's say. Well, just give me the price. What is the price? It's like 169.40. Okay, so one, let's call it 169. So here we go. Pay attention. Why not get paid to do something I'm already prepared to do. So Apple's at 169, and I'm thinking I'm putting in a limit order at 168. I'm thinking about telling my broker that if you can buy Apple at 168 or less, to do so. My broker says, Dean, let me get this right. You want to pay 168 or less for Apple currently at 169? I go, yes. He goes, Dean, your limit order may not go off. I said, well, gee, you're pretty rude. And you say, Dean, you say you're going to be happy, but let's say your order gets filled at 167. Yeah, ooh, well, yeah, you say that, but if it goes to zero, you're not going to be so happy. I go, geez, why are you being such a Debbie Downer? He said, well, Dean, what I would like to suggest is an alternative to your buy limit order is why not sell a put? Right now, you can get Dean four points to agree to buy Apple at 170. You just told me you're willing to buy Apple. I said, well, not at 170. Dean, take a deep breath. If you sell an Apple 170 put at four and you get exercised, you'd be paying 166 for Apple that's at 169. Shorting a put test point is a way to get the stock at less than the current market price, which is yeah. the same as a buy limit. So that's an alternative to a buy limit. That is not so stupid to get paid to do something I'm already prepared to do. If I'm already prepared to buy Apple and somebody will pay me, I'll say, I'll take it. Now, again, it's better than the buy limit because at least I get to keep something. If Apple goes 170 or higher, the put expires and I keep the $400. By buy limit, I got nothing. My buy limit never gets filled. You know, Apple goes, it stays at 169 or higher, you know. No, no money there. So, you know, we would uh, sell puts on stocks we're willing to buy. And we'd be bullish, right? I wouldn't want to buy Apple unless I thought it was going up. All right, so that's a short put. Short puts make a lot more sense than short calls. Now, my broker is going to say, uh, Dean, you're creating an app uh, obligation to buy 100 shares of uh, Apple 170. And I'm looking at your account, Dean, and you don't have cash equal to the aggregate exercise price. You know, what my broker wants me to have in my account is 17 grand so that I can pay for the Apple stock. And that would be called a covered put. A covered put is when I actually have enough money in the account to pay. Yeah, I know this. There you go. And naked would be if you didn't have anything. Yeah, naked. If it, if you're naked, it's way beyond the seven million. And then I have to come up with 20% of the market value plus the current premium, less the out of the money amount. Right. So that, you know. That would be 20% of 17 grand plus the premium of four. It's out of the money. Yeah, well, no, it's in the money. So skip that step. And whatever that number is, that's the margin requirement. Okay. Right. Yeah. Anything else? Never thought I'd miss learning about options. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, but be careful. You know, that's <laughs> the danger in these calls. Uh, I thought you got, got, got over a little bit because I thought Isaac's, uh, most of his six questions I thought will more reflect the 66 than they do his six. Uh, so, but yeah. And then, you know, again, we talk about everything in these calls, right? I think Taj's question, 
was perfect too, because that's on every exam, this idea of defensive stock. So we got kind of lucky in this overtime session that uh, I thought most of what we were discussing was kind of on the broad avenues and highways of uh, a lot of different exams, which is always a good thing. Uh, anything else here before I uh, go uh, tune up? The, what do I got tonight? I got the Lakers and the Pelicans. Woohoo! And then I you know the Warriors and the Kings. Uh, that would be interesting. You know, Josh Harris of Apollo Global Management owns the Sixers. Oh, yeah, of course. All the private equity guys are rich. My friend, David Rubenstein, just bought the uh, order. Carlisle. Yeah, Carlisle. I, I tutored him. Uh, it's funny. Oh. He, yeah, so it was funny. Uh, David, he, I, he got me an apartment. I spent literally, you know, geez, I don't know, like three, four months at, at Carlisle tutoring him and everybody else. Anyways, uh, he, he said, do you think I'm the only guy doing this? I go, absolutely. I said, David, most people would, you know, get out of it somehow but anyways it was so funny he called me uh this is like oh i don't know like 11 months later he said dean my daughter is getting a job at goldman sachs uh, wealth management and uh you know i'd like you to come out and tutor her i go absolutely he sent his private plane to get me and then you know uh hauled me back and i stayed in the pool house danny his pool house is a mansion i mean i would love to be the pool boy anyways i'm tutoring her and david says I'm flying to Monaco and maybe you, Dean, should fly with me so he can tutor you on the plane. I go, absolutely. And then she goes, oh, no, daddy, I got to start class. And I said, Alexa, your dad has hired me so you don't have to go to class. And she you know, said, well, I'll just call Lloyd, like blank fine, and get you out of it. She goes, oh, don't do that. I said, hey, listen, Alexa, I want you flying around talking to rich people. That's what you want. To, they want you to do. I said, you need to get over that your dad is David Rubenstein. I tell everybody in the world I know David. You know, that's what, you know, that's part of it. So Josh Harris, I hear, uh, who is A-Rod in with the Timberwolves? Uh, Mark Lorry. Yeah, and what happened? I guess he was not interested in coming up with the rest of the money, right? So, yeah. You know. I mean, yeah, I guess you should never try to buy something you can't afford. Well, there you go. A uh, Kleiner. You're a millionaire in a billionaire's yeah. league. Joe Lacob was a partner at Kleiner Perkins. Yeah, I know. I know. I know. War. I know Joe Lacob was. He, yeah. He's from New Bedford, Massachusetts. Yeah, yeah. He was part of the limited partnership of the Celtics. So, yeah, we got a lot of private equity hedge fund guys. Stevie Cohen. Mm. Oh, Matt. Matt's. The Matt's. The yeah. Matt's. Right. He's outrageous. Hey. I mean, Stevie charges three and 30. 3.72 assets under two. management. That's right. Point seventy two insider and trading. Yeah. Well, it not, it, he took a two year failure supervise. His guy went to jail, Danny. So I don't know what he's gonna how he's gonna take care of that guy. <laughs> you know, when he gets out, he's probably gonna be okay. Right. Like, okay. So um, my last question would be like, because I know some like a, a, some of these like concepts before. Like, how yeah. do you think? I know I still need to do like open end and like front front well is it back end funds and also i need to well, well, know boy, like let's be very clear the difference between open end and closed end funds is closed like, end closed end very funds. very testable on every okay. i know you're going to get that again on your 66 and isaac you're going to get that on your six now remember on your six isaac you're not going to be allowed to sell all closed end funds except with a prospectus on the ipo so that's another one of those common threads through all of the exams, SIE 7, 65, 66, 6, the distinctions between open-end funds and closed-end funds, very, very testable. And then, I uh, yeah, I need to... A lot of ETF stuff, though. Uh, ETFs, yeah, very yeah. testable. You got to contrast yeah. an ETF with a traditional, traditional mutual fund, right? Okay. People don't like the idea of forward pricing, so ETFs don't have forward pricing. They trade supply and demand. You can't buy open and mutual funds on margin. ETFs are marginable. Uh, ETFs for test purposes are mostly passive. So they're more tax efficient and they have a lower cost structure. That's all very testable. Okay, right. that sounds... That's uh, Taj, what do you got, Taj? Hey, Dean. For discretionary and non-discretionary accounts, I always get uh, tripped up on that because um, when I'm working, uh, non-discretionary accounts is where we don't trade on that, right? And then I guess discretionary... Well, you know, it sounds like you're on the backside of the of the question, right? So it's kind of like uh, when you're backstage, it looks a little different. So okay. non-discretionary, if it's non-discretionary, Dodge, that's exactly right. That means I can't make decisions in that account about action, asset, or amount. 
If it's a non-discretionary account, I cannot make decisions as a third party about action asset amount. I would have to get the client's permission. I say, Taj, with your permission, I'd like to buy 10,000 shares of XYZ. Discretionary accounts, I can make decisions as a third party about action, whether to buy or sell, asset, which security to buy or sell, and the amount, the quantity. We do, do not need all of those. A one, two, or three, I'm going to have to have discretionary authority. The thing I don't need discretionary authority, so in a non-discretionary account, your point, I can make a decision about time and price without having trading authorization. So in a non-discretionary account, uh, the customer could say, Dean, buy 10,000 GE at whatever time and price you think looks good. That's acceptable. He told me action, buy. He told me asset GE, and he told me the amount. Acceptable. Right. If he if he says, Dean, buy 10,000, whatever you think looks good, I can't take that. So, you know, any decision, one, two, your point, Dodge, one, two or three of the A's. If I'm as a maker, third party, going to make a decision about any of those A's, I need to have discretionary authority on that account. And by the way, there's two versions of it. There's full trading authorization, full power of attorney and limited trading authorization, limited power of attorney. With full, not only can I make investment decisions, Taj, I can withdraw monies and securities from the account. With limited, I can only make investment decisions. Right? So anything else? That's that's very testable. I'll tell you, this group, you guys have been a good group for this overtime session. I, I haven't had any questions. I thought we're out in the middle of left field somewhere. This is all testable stuff. All can I throw one at you then? Sure, Dean? Sure, absolutely. Um, as for like insurance products, are what there you your time? <laughs> really? Yeah, absolutely. Thank the you, God. <laughs> yeah. The only insurance questions are going to be about variable annuities, which is really a mutual fund with an insurance wrapper. Uh, I just think it's a total waste of time. Amato's taking a 66, maybe a coach on capital needs analysis, perhaps, but, uh, the most of the questions are going to be on what are called variable annuities. Mutual funds with insurance wrapper. Waste of your time to be, you know, working on term versus whole or whole on universal life. Test prep vendors just go way in the weeds on that. But I would have a general understanding of variable annuities. But other than that, yeah, waste of time. That's a relief. Thank you so yeah, much. You bet. Uh, yeah. What else? Anything else? I need to, yeah, I need to know options. And I most likely need to know like the types of like accounts, especially like. Mar margin accounts well, so, margin is only three or four you know questions you know the okay. two basic types of accounts are cash accounts where you intend to pay in full very testable know that all custodial accounts and retirement accounts must be cash accounts so you have, to pay, in full. You have to pay in full right uh, they love to torment you you can't leverage up the kid and up my account and say hey my leverage you up didn't quite work out you got a maintenance call no right uh, margin, uh, there's three or four. We don't know what three or four they're going to be, uh, but you need to know the documentation. You need to know minimum maintenance. Uh, you need to know the 2000s trick, too stupid, but testable. You know, so there's uh, stuff there. I have a, mar a margin lecture, Danny, and I call it don't overdose. You know, don't, you know, watch that lecture and be done with it. I also have a tutoring replay where the person was at past perfect and they, we did margin questions from hell. I felt bad. She's paying me $225 an hour to do practice questions that she's never gonna see on the actual exam. But her firm is using Pass Perfect and they wouldn't let her get to the next unit unless she could get like, I forget what it was, ridiculous, like 90% on a Pass Perfect margin quiz. You know, I can't even do that. <laughs> so, you know, uh, you can watch that if you'd like. Uh, we just was had it? a report that somebody saw an SMA question, but it was pretty basic. So, uh, you know. SMA, oh. Yeah, if you tell me, you missed, I'll put it this way. If you tell me you missed your mark because of margin, I'm going to say, nah, you had bigger problems. Okay. You tell me so, like you missed your mark because you didn't know what a call of put was. You know, yeah. <clears throat> no, you didn't know what a muni was. Yeah. You didn't know what a mutual fund is. So, you know, uh, I think margin, you know, if there's any two chapters in the old days, it, it came in a loose leaf binder. And my brother, when he came to work for me, he would ask me how many questions. And then when I would answer him like margin, I'd tell him three or four. He, he would take it out of the loose leaf binder and throw it in the trash. And the binder went down. He goes, Dean, is this 72% of the material? I go, well, yeah. And he goes, well, I'm just going to learn this with 100% accuracy. 
you know, he passed. I want to write FINRA and say there's old things that he has no clue about. Now, I'm not suggesting you do that, but if there are any two chapters that you, if you weren't going to read the book, don't get me wrong, you should read the book. Yeah. If there are any two chapters in any test prep vendor manual that I would feel comfortable ripping out of there and putting in the trash can, it's partnerships and margin. Those okay. All test prep vendors go so overkill. I mean, I know. There's, they test I know like recourse notes and non recourse notes and uh, test prep vendors, not the actual test. The vendors. So those are two areas where I think vendors go completely overkill. Uh, All right, anything you, else? Do you know like the uh the dummies version SIE? Uh I, I I think the series seven of dummies I think are good value. They don't have enough uh, practice questions and content, I think, to to pass, but as a paid supplement, I think it's pretty reasonable. Right? What do they want? 20 bucks or something? Yeah, yeah, because I also because there's two like they not only have like a textbook, but they also have like a thousand pre practice. Yeah, I think I think it's a good value. I mean, you know, what is it? It's I think it's a price point at which, you know, if you want more questions, why not? So I, would you how in depth is it for the SIE? Not at all. Options aren't even in depth. You know, maybe three option questions on the SIE. So you know, but I always want you to overlearn the SIE because yeah. if you overlearn the SIE, you can almost pass out of the six. And it lays a good foundation for your seven. So we have SIE, uh, three or four option questions, mainly recognition, like when do options expire? What's the difference oh. between American and European style exercise? Oh, yeah, you mentioned that. Like, what, what does the OCC Europe? do? What's the Option Clearing Corporation do? So almost the S most of the SIE is recognition. Recognition. Uh, yeah. Uh, okay. Closing purchase, Brooke, is how we eliminate or reduce a short position. Right. So that's important closing purchase type of orders. So, Brooke, a closing purchase is used to eliminate, reduce, or offset a short position. So, I call my broker and I say, Hey, Danny, I'm not comfortable with that short call anymore. Let's get it back, man. You know, what is it at now? Remember, I sold it at, uh, let's say, seven. He said, Dean, it's 11. I go, Let's buy it back and be done with it. And I lose four. You know, Brooke, contracts exist outside of the securities industry. Right. So we were just talking, Brooke, about basketball. One of my favorite basketball players, a guy named Chris Dudley, he played center at Yale, not a, uh, you know, a school for the NBA. He did, an opening this sale. Year, March Madness. he did an opening sale, Brooke, of his contract for $10 million. It's money in opening sale. He short that contract. He went to the Knicks and said, listen, we agree it's a bust. How about I buy back my contract for $2 million? So he did a closing purchase of $2 million. So we sold the contract for 10. He bought it back for two. So Brookie made $8 million. The difference between what he sold the contract for, sold it short, and he bought it back. Now, if you ask him how he became a millionaire, I'm not sure he says he was a basketball player or he says, I sold a contract high, I bought it back low. So you have opening sales. That's to uh, establish the short position, closing purchase. So that answer set is very testable. Every time, you know, A, opening purchase, B, opening sale, C, closing purchase, D, closing sale, all of that is testable. Let's say which of the following orders is used to establish or add to a long position, opening purchase. If they say which of the following is used to establish or add to a short position, opening sale. Which of the following is used to eliminate or reduce a long position, closing sale? This is testable in the SIE, everything. And which of the following year point, Brooke, is used to eliminate or reduce a short position, closing purchase? So option contracts, Brooke, can be traded, they can be exercised, or they can expire. A good memory aid device for that, Brooke, is T. T, the option contract can be traded, that means opening and closing transactions. It can be exercised. That means, you know, you can say, I want to exercise my call contract. Or you can be exercised if you're short. Or the options can expire. If the option expires, there's no need to do the closing purchase, right? I go neener, neener, neener. I get to keep the money. All right, anything else? Thanks, Dean. My pleasure, guys and gals. Perfect.
Hey, Thank you know you, what? Uh, you know, we might have to do this more often. I usually do it every three weeks or so, but who knows if I can keep it together, you know, maybe, as I said, Isaac, I got a lot going on. So I don't think yeah. the right answer is to start doing more free stuff on, on the booking page, you know, <laughs> <laughs> the right solution. I'll be in but, touch. Yeah, please do. Please do. Let's try and slam that in there if we can. I'm thinking, I'm taking mom to the airport. I'm sending her off to Europe and then I'm going to Mexico as soon as I drop her. So that's going to be, I won't be back till Tuesday or Wednesday. So if we do it. It's going to have to be like Wednesday, Thursday, you're testing Friday. And I don't want to damage your confidence and so you know we, we need to kind of see where, where you're at on practice tests right now uh my practice tests the last two i have taken have all been passing one was a good. 70 well, the other one was a 76 okay, good okay so that makes me more likely to do it. i don't want to you know we don't want to do that the day before your testing oh my god you're in trouble <laughs> <laughs> we want to be able to say yeah hey yeah i just stick the landing so yeah let's no. definitely let's, let's definitely try no. and get that done. i want to get it done because i want to put I feel sorry that six is getting neglected uh, to a certain extent by everybody. And so, like I said, I think it would be helpful to get some more content up on the channel for, for six people. So, yeah, uh, I'll, I mean, I'll, I'll email you, send you a text. Yeah, please do. I'm not trying to get it done. And then, do. yeah, if we want to like. Worst kind of... case, I do have permission to use STC, uh, but you know, we can, it's easier to use Kaplan because I just have it, but uh, we'll try and get it done. Cause I also want to get somebody. I don't, I, I like having different content. You know, I, again, I like to be able to have people see other things besides, you know, just just Dean or just, you know, Kaplan. So, all right, everybody, off to basketball I go. Awesome. Right, yeah, I'm, I'm going to review yeah. the SI.